So I'm going to get started on the uh, next section. Um, yeah, by way of introduction, uh, my name is Miguel. Uh, I was introduced to start. I also work with uh, John, uh, Dell, and uh, Alex in um, the, the Prism AI Labs. And uh, today I will be talking about um, deep Q learning, which is a um, different approach to Q learning than TQL, uh, where instead we'll be uh, using uh, a function. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself here. So um, as John presented in the previous section, uh, TQL uses a table to store the Q values for our state action pairs. As you see in the bottom here, we have an entry for each state and action. But you know, it's not difficult to imagine a scenario where we have a lot of states and a lot of actions. So for example, if we had 10,000 states and 10,000 actions, then we'd have to maintain a table with 100 million entries. And clearly that gets out of hand quite quickly. So instead of maintaining a table, maybe instead we could learn a function which takes in as inputs a state and an action and then outputs the corresponding Q value. This would allow us to handle you know, state um, and action spaces of a much larger size. And that's exactly the idea behind um, DQNs, where for this mapping function, we'll be using a deep neural network. So as shown in the bottom left here, we have our state, we have our action, it's going to pass through a network, and we're going to get a Q value for that state and action. Another motivation for uh, DQNs is um, you can kind of be seen in this example here. So on the left here, we have this, this agent who's playing the Atari game Breakout. And as he's playing, he's collecting training data and filling in his TQL table. So this is our TQL approach here. However, what happens if during inference, we all of a sudden see a state that we didn't see during training. So if it's not in our Q table, what do we do? Do we maybe randomly pick an action for that state or try to find a similar state? Well, this is kind of one of the big downsides of TQL, which using DQN can solve. With DQN, we can still apply our Q network on these unseen states as we have on the right here. And if our Q network is well-trained, it should be able to generalize to these states um, quite well because of the similarity to maybe previously seen states. Furthermore, uh, DQN allows us to handle states which don't really fit nicely into a table. So in our frozen lake example, we had this grid, so it was easy to translate this grid into table entries uh, with our actions. But in this breakout game example, it's not necessarily clear how we would actually take this image and put it into a table. You know, Perhaps we could hash it, and there's definitely some workarounds, but it doesn't naturally map. And even if we did hash it, we would be losing some information. But use, since DQNs use a uh, neural network, we can kind of build off all this work on computer vision, um, which you know, neural networks have had a lot of success with. Um, and this allows us to handle much more complex states as well as states we haven't seen before. And hopefully, if our network has been well-trained, we can take advantage of the similarities of our states. Our, our network kind of works as a feature extractor, and we will potentially perform quite well on states we haven't seen before if they are similar to states we have seen. So unfortunately, I don't have time to go into the details of neural networks uh, in this tutorial. Um, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with them already. So I'll give a very quick one slide recap for those who aren't um, familiar. As the name might suggest, they're motivated by the idea of neurons in biology. And what we have is we have these different nodes, as we see in this diagram here. And these nodes um, are compo composed different layers, which take in information from the previous layer through these arrows, sum them up, sum up the, their inputs, and pass them through a nonlinearity to the following layer. And the way that we train them is simply by training these weights connecting these different nodes. And we train them by minimizing a loss function on the output. And this is, and this is done via gradient descent. 
And it's been shown that neural networks can um, approximate a wide variety of functions, um, which allows us to do quite well in a lot of settings. So one quick twist to what I said previously. Um, in practice, we actually don't take in the state and the action as inputs. Um, what we do is we actually simply take in the state and then output a vector of Q values for all actions. Uh, and this is represented in this equation here. So we take in the state in our network and we output one Q value for each action. And the reason we do this is that it allows us to call our network only once per state instead of once for every state action pair and um, lets us take care of, uh, take advantage of the potential parallelism. During inference, when we're actually using, when the agent is actually um, being evaluated, it selects the action which has the highest Q value from this, this vector. And if there's multiple maxima, you can simply uh, randomly break ties. And then during training, uh, we encounter this, this issue again that John presented previously, this, this idea of balancing um, exploration and exploitation. And here what we do is we take, we use an epsilon greedy algorithm to, to, to balance it. So during training with some small probability epsilon, we'll select an action at random. And then with probability one minus epsilon, we select the optimal action. Um, as we are doing uh, during inference. And this allows us to exploit actions we know do well during training. So for example, not falling into a, an icy hole um, while still allow us to explore new actions which might lead to better rewards in the future. So traveling around our lake, for example, to try to get to the goal. So once again, we have our Q learning equation here where we have our new Q values, which um, are updated based on a learner rate, our TD target, which is composed of our reward plus our discounted uh, future Q value here, as well as our, 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 current, uh, our Q value for the current state in action. And our goal here is we, we, we wanna train our Q network to, to optimize, to minimize this TD residual. So we're gonna use gradient ascent to minimize this TD residual. And as John mentioned previously, the, the intuition here is that our, our TD target, this, this term with the reward and, and the maximum action is a better estimate of a Q value because A, of course, it already accounts for the reward that we're getting by selecting this action but also it's also closer to the terminal state where we do in fact know the Q value since that's where we will be receiving our reward. So we're trying to move our current estimate towards this future more accurate estimate. In the simplest setup, we can do this Q learning update at every time step, but we could also potentially batch, it, batch the updates which might help with the stability. And um, if you are familiar with neural networks, you will uh, be familiar with the concept of, of batch updates. So to summarize a couple of the pros and cons of DQN, and this will kind of motivate as well some of the, the, the other approaches in reinforcement learning that we will be talking about later. The DQN approach can be kind of seen as compressing the Q table down. Instead of having to maintain this large, potentially very large Q table, we can use a, a network uh, to get our Q values, which allows us to represent a much larger state action space. It allows us to handle states not seen during training, uh, as we saw with the breakout example. And the Q network can also be seen as a feature extractor, which allows us to generalize to these Q values we haven't seen before and actually do quite well. And one more thing to note is that it can leverage, we can learn both on and off policy. So, We'll see this in a couple of slides, but uh, we can revisit some of the transitions we saw in previously and use, the, use those to learn on. So we can train on these off policy examples um, and that allows it to be a lot more sample efficient. Um, and this is a big advantage compared to, to policy gradient, which we'll be discussing later because in policy gradient, you can only learn on policy. So by allowing us to learn both an on and off policy, we can kind of take advantage of, of all these transitions that we've seen. 
one of the some of the downsides of DQN is that just like TQL, it still can't deal with stochastic policies. Everything's deterministic. We're taking the the maximum action um, when our agent is interacting with the environment and being evaluated. It also can't be directly applied to continuous action spaces. We could kind of get around this by discretizing the continuous action spaces, but um, in, in certain instances that, that may not be what you want to do and you'd want to deal with a continuous action space directly and DQN simply can't do that. And then finally, uh, as I mentioned, we need to separately have this epsilon greedy algorithm to balance exploration versus exploitation. And it would be nice if, if, you know, if we could have our wish list for our ideal model if um, this exploration exploitation balance was actually implicit in the model and we could take advantage of this concept of like action uncertainty um, as, as, we are, as we are learning and interacting with the environment. So that's the basic DQN setup. Um, there's a couple extensions that I'll briefly discuss here because they do come up in the exercise. So one of the um, one of the extensions is is called Experience Replay, and the idea here is you decouple your batch updates of of your model from your your experience stream. So how that works is that as you interact with the environment you save your, your transitions. So a tuple of state, action, reward, and next state. And you take that tuple, tuple and you store it into a memory buffer. And then uh, when you want to update your model, you'll simply randomly sample from that replay buffer and apply your QLearning update. And this can help a lot with the stability of the training because you're reducing the correlation between all the items in your batch because they're sampled from, from the memory. Another improvement is target networks. So the idea with a target network, um, if we look at this equation on the bottom here, is that in your TD target, instead of using your Q network, your, your normal Q network, which we'll call the online network, you're going to use a, an additional Q network called the target network. And the reason you'd like to do that is that in the normal, in, in the standard approach, this target, because it also is dependent on this, this Q network, it's, it's kind of a moving target, right? You're updating your Q network and that changes both your, your, your value, th this right value in the, in the residual, but it also changes your target. So it's kind of, you're chasing this moving target which can make it difficult to learn and quite unstable. So the idea here is you actually create a second, tar a second Q network here, this target network, and that kind of stabilizes your, your, your goal and really kind of stabilizes the training. So you have, a, you have two networks, you have the target network, the online network, the online network you update as usual as we saw before, and then this target network you, you infrequently update it based on, on this online network. You're going to kind of copy over all, all the weight values every once in a while to, 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 to update it. In that same vein, um, and this is this, this, there's this idea of double DQN. So double DQN builds off this idea of a target network, except that instead of using the target network to select the value, you'll be, uh, sorry, to select the action, you'll be using your online network to select the action. So you select the action with the online network, you pass it through the target network to get your, your target Q value, and then you update as normal. So this decoupling of the, this full decoupling of the action selection and the evaluation um, helps kind of reduce this, these, these estimate, estimation issues uh, with, with the Q values. And once again, kind of leads to more stable learning. So kind of all these extensions are really focused on improving the stability um, of, of the, the, the DQN approach. And then of course, there's a bunch more work uh, that's been done in this to, to, to improve on this, this, these, these basic DQN approaches. We can use prioritized replay. So instead of randomly sampling from our replay memory, we can prioritize certain memories. So for example, if some of the transitions that we saw have a very high TD residual, we, can, we, we could say that those transitions are potentially more useful to learn from than those where we're doing a very good job of estimating DQ values already. Um, we can also, uh, there's, there's also another extension on top of double, uh, similar to double DQN where we, it's called double, uh, dueling DQN. Um, and there's a little bit sometimes of confusion in the liter literature here because they both get abbreviated to DDQN. 
Um, but the idea here is you split your estimate of the Q value into two parts. Instead of estimating just the Q value, you estimate the value of the state as well as um, the advantage of taking a, an action given that state. And this will actually come up again in, uh, in the discussion on actor critics where you have this, this idea of a state baseline. Um, and this helps with the, uh, the variance of your updates. Okay, so that leads us to the next exercise. So you can follow the quick links on the website here or use this direct link, which we will post in the chat. Um, and similar, once again, just make sure you open it in Colab and the setup should be similar to the TQL. Um, there's both the basic DQN implementation as well as, uh, as, well as um, the, the experience replay is also in there as well as the target network. Um, and once again, feel free to ask questions in the chat or to unmute yourself and ask questions. And I think we'll be uh, setting up breakout rooms as well. Thank you.